With this panel, we, um, I'm going to just introduce the moderator who will speak, uh, who will introduce all of our speakers. We're really happy to have all of our four guests here with us for this panel. And Tim Hanstead, CEO of Landessa and board member of Global Washington, will be moderating this. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. This is a great opportunity. And you are in for a treat because in this panel, we have three very dynamic, very knowledgeable, very experienced women uh, in, from the global development sector. And we are going to have what is uh, hopefully a conversation with, with each other. I'm actually going to try to get out of the way a bit and let, let them speak. But then also there will be an opportunity at the end for you to present questions to our, our three distinguished panelists. So first, let me start with a, a, a brief introduction of each. I, I won't do any of them justice. Their, their, their bios are in your program, so I won't take the time to go over it in detail. But starting to my right, Carolyn Miles. Uh, Carolyn is CEO of a small nonprofit you may have heard of called Save, Save the Children. Um, she actually, the first woman CEO of Save the Children, um, started this earlier this year as CEO, but previously had been the chief operating officer of Save the Children, which you all know as a leading independent organization creating lasting change in the lives of children throughout the world and, and also here in the United States. The, uh, the organization has grown under her uh, leadership as COO. It grew from $140 million a year to more than $550 million a year. And now I understand um, annual, annual expenditures of about $600 million per year. So thank you, Carolyn, for, for joining us here today. Thanks, Tim. To Carolyn's right is Nancy Lindbergh. Nancy currently is the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Prior uh, to this position, which is an extremely important position in the current turbulent times, uh, Nancy was the president of, uh, of another small nonprofit you may have heard of that's on our, what, what people at Global Washington sometimes call the Corridor of Compassion, um, which, which we in, the, in this part of the world refer to as uh, Interstate 5. <laughs> <laughs> Mercy Corps International, uh, based in Portland, Nancy was the president there for, for 14 years. So thank you, Nancy, for joining us today. And to Nancy's right, Liz Schreyer, who serves as the founding executive director of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. And the coalition is a broad-based influential network of 400 business, businesses, NGOs, national security and foreign policy experts, faith-based academic and community leaders in all 50 states who support a smart power approach of elevating diplomacy and development alongside defense in order to build a better, safer world. What a great mission, huh? Uh, Liz was saying earlier that if we had Global Washington in every state, then maybe her organization could go out of business or, or just be active in, go out of business. <laughs> in, in coordinating the activities. So a very distinguished panel. Um, and I'm going to give the opportunity for each of them to make a, a brief opening response to a question. And then we're going to have some Q&A up here and give you the opportunity to ask questions of the panel for the last 30 minutes. So get ready with your, your questions. I'm going to start with Carolyn. And the same question for all three of you mm -hmm. to start with. Where do you find yourself within the current dynamic of global development? Well, first of all, thanks, Tim, and uh, it's great to be here with Nancy and Liz and, um, and all of you. Um, I think this is a fantastic event, and, and I would love to see it happen in other states and other places. Um, I, I think, first of all, I would say, and I know many of you in the audience are here as development professionals, I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be in international development. There are 
lots and lots of opportunities. There are also lots of challenges. Obviously, we all know what those are. Um, but I think there's two things that I wanted to, to focus on. One is the, uh, the focus on results. And I think that in times like these, it is critically important for all of us, whatever we do in the international development or global development space, to be talking about the results that we have for our constituents. And um, I'll just give you three quick examples from, from Save the Children's work. And as Tim said, we, we are a large organization. Um, we work in actually about 90 countries on the ground right now. And our focus is really on health, education, livelihoods um, for kids, and child protection. Those are the things that we really focus on. And um, three, three examples I'll give you of uh, results. And when we talk about results, we're looking for results at scale. So we are looking for results that we can replicate and bring to more than one place. We do the work on the ground, but our real objective is to take those programs to scale. So one of the programs that we're working on now is uh, in uh, elementary education in the international space. And we've done a lot of work to look at. It's great that there's been huge, tremendous progress to get kids into school around the world. There are still 70 million kids that aren't in school, but there's been a huge push to get children into school and been very successful. But we started looking at the results of the, the educational results for those kids in developing countries a couple years ago and found that um, kids were not getting through to the fifth grade actually being able to read. So it's great to get kids into school, but if they can't read, what are we, what are we doing in terms of the program work that we do? So we started a program called Literacy Boost. And it focuses very specifically on making sure that children get to the fifth grade and they can read. It also, as it turns out, allows us to focus a lot on girls. Because if you go to a classroom in the developing world, you see 100 kids in the first grade. It's half boys, half girls. By the time you get to the fifth grade, there's 20 kids and there's two girls. So focusing on girls and making sure that girls have a specific um, uh, we have a specific program that really allows to pulls girls through elementary school is one of the things we're now working on and having tremendous results with that kind of a program. We use that to take that to governments in the countries where we work and get them to take it up and bring it to scale along with involving lots of other uh, people in that, in that space. So that's one example. Another example, and this will lead me into um, to talking a little bit about partnerships, which this is the second thing I wanted to touch on. In our child maternal health programs, um, one of the things that babies die, and that about 40% of the under five deaths are among uh, newborns, first month of life. And a lot of children are dying of as asphyxia. So they're literally, um, they can't breathe, and there's no capability to get any help to get them to breathe. And so we've done a program with USAID, um, Johnson & Johnson, and Save the Children that really focuses on this very specific issue, had great success in changing that, um, that statistic in several developing countries and making sure that we uh, are, are there and have trained people who can, can really help babies breathe. And that uh, initiative has really driven the child mortality rate down. And the third example I'll give is that I think we specifically need to focus on low resource situations. So in places like Nepal and Bangladesh, we have, a great, we have great examples where those are some of the poorest countries in the world. They have driven the child mortality rate down, and they have done it because they've had, first of all, organizations like Save the Children and many others focusing on making sure there are community health workers there where kids are dying in these communities. But more importantly, that we've brought in the local and the national government into that work, where we found people that really said in Nepal and Bangladesh, these kids do not have to die. We don't have to have these kinds of statistics in our country. We might be poor, but we actually absolutely can save our own children. And those kinds of results are ones that we really, again, have to, have to kind of get out there. So the, the second, so the, those are really some very concrete results. You all have results about what you do. It's critically important right now that we talk about those things at work. The second thing that I think is so important, and part of the reason the three of us are here, is that partnerships and working in partnerships is the only way 
that we are going to achieve the goals that we have for children uh, in Save the Children. We are not going to do it on our own. We're not going to drive down the child mortality rate. We're not going to get more kids to read by the fifth grade. We're not going to solve some of the issues, the huge issues for children in poverty right here in the United States. And we, in fact, work in the state of Washington as well on that issue. Um, if we don't do it in partnership. And it's not, um, it's not the traditional way of thinking about partnerships and nonprofits where we kind of think about it as one-to-one. -one. It's really saying there's an issue, whether it's child mortality or whether it's quality of education. We want to get all the people who care about that issue around the table contributing to solving those issues in any way that they can. So whether that's governments, whether that's UN agencies, whether that's big NGOs, whether that's small NGOs, we really need to get people around the issues, not so much around the funding or around the geography, but around the issues. And so we're finding more and more that I certainly am spending a lot of my time uh, trying to put together those kinds of partnerships and being at the table as a partner with many others who are focusing on those issues. So I just wanted to touch on those two things, and I know we'll come back to those. But to me, results and partnerships in this time of real challenge for global development are, are really critical. Thank you, Carolyn. Perfect. Thanks, and I know that USAID has increasingly been focused on, on both of these topics, too, results and, and partnerships. So Nancy, same question for you. Where do you see yourself, your, your agency, in this current dynamic? Great. Thanks, Tim. And uh, it's great to be back on the West Coast. I don't get here often enough these days. Um, and um, wonderful to, to be here with, with Liz and Carolyn. This is um, a wonderful event, uh, and to see everybody gathered to talk about these issues. Um, I could say a lot about results and partnerships uh, as critical. Um, I want to start, though, by noting that this, at the end of this week, we're celebrating USAID's uh, 50th anniversary, the actual 50 years later uh, from when President Kennedy signed the bill that put this agency um, uh, into, into life and uh, really embodied, I think, what the American public wanted to do in terms of international engagement. And so we've been having an opportunity to look back and say, what have we accomplished in these last 50 years? And it's a wonderful moment to look at some incredible successes when we do have sustained and, and significant development investments. And one of the best examples is uh, South Korea, which is now a major donor. Uh, we have an MOU with them to, to uh, uh, work together on aid issues, and they're a significant trading partner. And in fact, 11 of the 16 biggest importers of US goods and services were former aid recipients. Uh, so we're seeing that, that uh, a lot of us talk about how it takes time to see these results. We are actually seeing significant results where we've been able to help countries emerge as democratic allies and important trader, trading partners um, that make a difference in terms of our global security, our um, and our uh, economic health. So though it, it's being able to capture those results over time that I think are very, very persuasive. At the same time, we are also looking at that bottom billion in the world. And we were just talking earlier that we've just hit 7 billion of a global population who are trapped in poverty and conflict um, and unable to move forward on that development pathway. My bureau within AID, the Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, is um, specifically organized around a set of capabilities and flexible funding mechanisms and expertise that enables us to really tackle fragility, whether it's in a prevention uh, approach, a response when there is a crisis or a shock, and then to foster faster and more effective recovery. And this is so critical because we know that when a conflict erupts or a disaster hits and a country isn't able to withstand those shocks, that you roll back really important development gains. There was a UN report that after the floods last year in Pakistan, that that part of Pakistan lost five years in its pursuit of the Millennium Development Goals. And we know that not a single conflict-affected country is on track to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. So 
the, the opportunity is to enable a more uh, con um, coordinated and full partnership on creating that greater resilience. Um, and I want to just talk about a couple of things related to that. First of all, is the importance of democracy, rights, and governance. And we're seeing that fundamentally when a country is overwhelmed by conflict or crisis, it's almost always a matter of weak, unaccountable governance. And it's the difference between a 7.2 earthquake in Haiti and a 7.2 earthquake in Turkey. And the difference between you know th uh, 3 million people affected in Haiti and a much more contained response in Turkey. And I would add that we've spent 10 years in partnership with Turkey, helping them become more effective uh, d managers of disaster. They've put a lot of energy into upgrading their business codes. Uh, they've taken very seriously the importance of being able to, uh, to manage shock. And the results are startling. Um, secondly, we know in places like the Horn of Africa that they will have droughts cyclically. And what used to be an every 10-year drought is now coming faster and faster, so that the drought that we're seeing right now in the Horn, which is the worst climactically in 60 years, is in fact, despite the, the, the shocking numbers of 13-point million people who are now affected, it would have been much worse without the programs that many of all of us have been doing in Ethiopia and Kenya where 8 million people in Ethiopia are not falling into crisis because of the programs that we've done with product, productive um, safety nets, uh, the, uh, helping communities of pastoralists and agro-pastoralists have alternatives that enable them to withstand uh, when their, their uh, crops and their uh, livestock are affected by drought, um, helping women uh, have a greater role so that they're sending their kids to school because they know that they need other alternatives than just farming on a very small plot of land. Um, we're seeing that progress uh, and we need to stay with it and we need to continue to focus on building that resilience so in places like the Horn we don't have to invest half a billion dollars every year in emergency response but can move those communities towards longer term. Um, where we aren't seeing that, of course, is in Somalia, where you've had 20 years of, of tr uh, no governance and conflict and is the only place right now in the Horn that's moving into famine. So as we look ahead with the turbulence, um, we know that we need to um, continue to focus on all these kinds of prevention uh, activities, which is stronger, more accountable governance, more inclusive governments. It's helping to prevent the impact of shocks through creation of resiliency. Uh, it's working together on more effective responses when disaster does hits and use of better technologies and partnerships. And it's helping that recovery to happen. Um, <laughs> President Obama uh, and, uh, and our administrator of AID, uh, Administrator Shaw, have really focused on uh, a Feed the Future initiative, which is about building that resilience and turning it into longer term development. We're seeing those results, and we know looking back 50 years, that development can have a profound impact uh, on the ability of these countries to move forward. What we need is sustained attention, and we need to be able to continue this kind of engagement and these sorts of development investments so that we can move from emergency to longer term and help these countries become the kind of uh, allies and trading partners that create the kind of world that we all want to live on. And I think uh, uh, events like today are a really important part of ensuring that that conversation moves forward in the turbulent times that sometimes we have in Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> yes. Um, and that sustained attention, of course, is something that Global Washington is trying to play a, a role in and is doing so successfully. But Liz, same question. How do you see, assess the current uh, dynamic and, and what role is your uh, network playing in it? 
Um, well, I think that the global Washington is the exact jumping off point. I am thrilled to be here, and I really meant it when I said to Tim and Carolyn and Nancy, if you existed all over the country, we could put ourselves out in business because you're doing the essence of speaking out about how development is different and is changing and, and, and is moving forward. It is a absolute thrill for me to be with these two fabulous women. And as you already heard, they are two of the most dynamic and effective experts in development today. So what I want to add in this opening is to, is to add a, a perspective of what we're seeing is a sea change in the way people think about development that you all have known for a long time, the two of you have known for a long time, but the other Washington, Washington DC, I think is kind of getting up to speed. And there's two in particular that maybe I can share in the opening. One is the sea change of the definition of development. That if we had been meeting here 10 years ago, we might be talking about, and again, I'm giving a Washington DC perspective, not a Washington state perspective, but it often is talked about as foreign aid. And I like to say when I go to Capitol Hill and meet with policymakers, foreign aid isn't foreign anymore. It is so about uh, our whole interconnected world. And to give you an example of this, about a year ago, my organization, the USGLC, we got, I got a call from the White House. Uh, the president was finishing up the touches on their presidential directorate policy study on development, on looking at what development means. And would we be willing to host a announcement about what was called the PPD, the Presidential Policy Directive on Development? And I said, sure, we have our conference actually a couple weeks away. Who would you like to send? So who did they send, the White House send? They sent Secretary Clinton, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, Secretary of the Treasurer uh, Tim Geithner, the head of Nancy's agency USAID Dr. Raj Shaw, and the head of the Millennium Challenge Corporation Daniel Johannes, all five on the stage for one hour talking about development. And my point of that is, is that development, again, what you've known for some time, but Washington DC finally caught up, is that development is so much broader than the old you know, way of people thinking about it as whether it's the, the old stereotype of just giving something away to some country or it's just about what's happening on the ground in terms of the kind of development that traditionally had been given, but is really connected to economic growth, and creating the sustainability and a whole of government approach to think about why did they have the military, the Defense Department, the Treasury Department, along with the Secretary of State. So I think start with that, it, that we, we have a different definition of a broader way of thinking about development. And it goes to Carolyn's point, is that it's also about not just the public sector and what we're contributing, but what the private sector is bringing to this, whether that's foundations, whether it's nonprofits, or whether that is the for-profit uh, business sector. And that is the second sea change I'm seeing. So one is a broader definition of de development, of how you think about it, how it can be used, how it can be used to advance our national security, our economic interests, as well as our moral values. But then the second sea change is who is in the game in terms of talking about development and wanting to participate and advocating. And that gets back to my first point about why Global Washington is so critical. Because what you're doing is what's happening all over the country, not as well as what you're doing here, but where businesses and nonprofits are joining together to talk to our policymakers about why development is so important to uh, America's national interests. And I think that's the sea change that I'm really seeing, and I'll talk about as we go on today. But I'll give you just a couple quick examples. We have put together a group of over 100 three and four star military leaders, generals and admirals, who spent their entire career fighting to keep America safe. And they are willing to go up to Capitol Hill with us to talk to policymakers about why, from a national security perspective, development is so important. And I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where, including I remember a meeting with your Congressman Norm Dix, who obviously has been very focused on the, the defense industry throughout his career. And he kept saying, wait a minute, these are you as military leaders are here to talk about non-military tools of global engagement. 
and it changes the way people think about it. So that, that's just one example of a very different voice that has entered to talk about the very important work that both Carolyn and Nancy do each and every day. Thank you, Liz. And just to come back with a question to you, how have you seen the support uh, for development policy change over that time period? Is there bipartisan support on the Hill, and, and particularly in these times? Um, it's harder than it used to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, it was nice to get out of Washington, D.C. for a little bit. When I, I, I have the privilege of teaching a, a, a course for, uh, Madeleine Albright teaches a course at Georgetown called uh, the National Security Toolkit, and I come in each, each semester and, and teach it just about development aid. And I always go back to 50 years ago, and I think about the bipartisan effort that it took to get USAID, and it wasn't mm -hmm. natural at first. Uh, Eisenhower really had to work with, uh, with a number of his, his colleagues across the aisle, and there were some complicating issues. Over the last 10 years, in the post-9-11 era, there really has been a very, very strong bipartisan support, and credit to George W. Bush for leading the way, not just in terms of the national security part, but obviously something that a lot of us care deeply about, but which is the work that he did in creating PEPFAR, in creating the work on malaria, in creating the work on the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Something happened in our country, as we all know, in the election of 2010. And we are seeing a uh, a, a dynamic that is so extreme in terms of partisanship on every issue. And one of the things that I've been very proud of around the issue of development is to be able to go up to Capitol Hill and say, development is one issue that, that is not partisan. Uh, but we're seeing some real concerns. Over the last three election cycles, a lot of the really strong Republicans who care deeply about these issues, some that have come from the state over the years, uh, have either chosen to retire or their voters have chosen to retire them. And we are looking at a change in champions. So the people who would really lead and go out there and make sure that the right bills and the resources got there each and every day, a lot of those members aren't there, particularly in the House. And so we're working to really rebuild some of that. And thank goodness there's some great leaders. There's a senator from South Carolina named Lindsey Graham. You probably see him on television office, a very good friend of John McCain's and was always with him in the, in the campaign in 2008, is now ranking member on the key committee in the Senate and has been fabulous. One of the big surprises, Marco Rubio. I don't know how many of you follow the new senator from Florida. He was considered the darling of the Tea Party when he was elected in 2010, and most people thought the Tea Party would be anti-foreign assistance and development. And he not only has been a leader on these issues, but I've seen clips where he does a, something on his website each week where he'll read some letters from his constituents, and he took one of them on foreign aid and said, looks in the camera and says, let me just tell you, Foreign aid is only 1%. We're not going to solve our deficit reduction problems by foreign aid. And let me tell you, if you use it effectively, here's why it's, it's good. So I think there's some hope, but I would be not honest with all of you if I didn't fear that we have to work very, very, very hard right now to keep partisan support. Yeah, I think um, I just want to pick up on something that Liz said. I think uh, in addition to, to what's going on politically, and all, all of these things are obviously very related, the economic reality of what we're, we're up against right now on the foreign aid side and the foreign development side is really um, startling. And I think that 1% figure is something that we all in this room can really do more about because there is this great misperception that somehow the foreign aid budget is going to solve all of our economic woes. And those of us, you know, most of us in this room know that that is just so far from the truth and that really in terms of the amount of money that the U.S. government spends on on international aid, that is some of the best money that can be spent, and making that argument and really pushing back in terms of the the uh, the, the budget cutting process that that just is not gonna that's not gonna get us anywhere. But yet it does seem to be the poster child for 
for a lot of those discussions. Mm -hmm. So I think the economic pressures are such that there's both the, the reality of having to obviously make some, some really deep cuts, but also the misunderstanding of how much we actually spend and, and how those dollars can really be effective, which kind of does bring me back to this results issue, Absolutely. which we have to keep really coming back to and saying, you know, these are, these are dollars that really do go a huge, huge way for the, for the American public and that people need to understand that. I, I would just add it's the results and it's the partnerships both with uh, the NGO sector and the private sector and uh, USAID just celebrated its 10th year of something called the Global Development Alliance which really enables us to partner with, um, with the private sector in a very uh, effective way. We just announced a partnership with PepsiCo and the World Food Program to produce a uh, ready-to-eat therapeutic food, a uh, high nutritious supplemental food in Ethiopia with Ethiopian chickpeas, which is a business uh, interest for PepsiCo, and it will enable groups like Save the Children and others to have a locally produced, highly nutritious food to use in the programs. So it's looking for those creative ways to leverage the capabilities and the resources of all different partners and what we've seen is a, is a significant commitment to focus with our international partners, to reach out to all of the donor nations and to encourage new countries to step up to the plate and become active participants in uh, addressing these, these global challenges. And I think that's an important message, is that we are uh, doing our share, that we are a, that we are a part of a system as opposed to the only responders or the only uh, investors in these approaches. Thanks. Well, Liz talked about, about sea change. And I know if we look back over the past year, one of the sea changes we've seen is in the Arab Spring. So Nancy, I'm wondering, as, as your agency looks at, at developments in that part of the world and, and these changes, what are the, the takeaways, maybe, for what types of interventions and, and assistance that have been provided around democracy and governance for that part of the world and what role they might have played and, and what are the lessons going forward? Um, I think, you know, everybody watched with extraordinary inspiration as all of the young people took to the streets in, in Tahir Square and, and we just had the Tunisian elections which had 70 percent participation, which, which is an enormous success in that it was peaceful, well-run um, election, and so Tunisia keeps showing the way of, what, of what's possible. I, you know, the, the presidential directive, the PDD that Liz talked about, President Obama specifically talks about the importance of, of democracy rights and governance as a key part of how we look at development. And uh, our administrator, Dr. Shaw, gave a speech in June that talks about the ways in which USAID will elevate democracy. We're creating within my bureau a center for excellence that, uh, a center for excellence for democracy rights and governance that will help us really bring together more of a thought leadership approach within USAID. And as a part of that, help us to understand what works and how is effective, accountable, transparent democratic governance a critical part of sustaining our development successes. Um, and uh, as we look ahead, I think the big lesson we learned is that we have to redefine stability. That when you have stability that is not equitable uh, and you have growth that is not equitable, that actually isn't stable. And so as we look ahead with our um, investments in agriculture and health, um, we need to ensure that those include in them an understanding of what are the uh, possible constraints in terms of the democratic governance of that country that need to be looked at uh, and, and take that into account as um, we uh, move with those programs. You know, it could be lack of land rights um, in a country that might foster instability down the road. That, I think, is the big takeaway, and that has enabled us to strengthen a direction that had already been set, but really bring it forward with additional vigor. Mm. 
Carolyn, coming back to you uh, as a leader of, of one of the, the leading and, and largest uh, NGOs that's been so successful in this sector, there's a lot of talk today about social business, about mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship, um, about other melded models of development, and some have even suggested that the, the traditional nonprofit um, approach is, is becoming obsolete. What, what would you say about that? Yeah, I, I think, um, I guess I would probably start by saying I don't think we're yet obsolete, although I, I actually hope that one day we will be obsolete. That is actually the job that Save the Children, the, the work that we do is to work ourselves out of a job, so I hope that one day we will be. Unfortunately, I don't think it's here yet. Um, but working with those social entrepreneurs and doing that both on the ground and globally, I think is critically important because, again, these issues are going to take all of us working together. So um, an example would be some of the work that we're doing in Ethiopia, which is really focused on um, working with uh, community health workers so that they are there when kids are sick and in the communities and when, when, they're, um, when they're at danger of dying. And one of the things we've looked at is partnering with some organizations that are giving these health workers the ability to actually make a living with these tiny little pharmacies that they carry around with them. And so I think combining the model of what we're doing, which is training health workers, equipping them with some kind of sustainable way for them to make a living um, is very, very important. And then we're working with the Ethiop Ethiopian government to try to push that model across the country and scale it up to, to something bigger. So it's not about one or the other. To me, it's about all and all of those models being put together, again, around the issues that um, you're really facing in our, uh, in our case for children. So I think it's about putting them all together. Tim, can Thanks. I add a point on that? One of the things that we're seeing is, um, we, the three of us were talking about it earlier, is, again, if we met 10 years ago and we were talking about what businesses are doing in the development space, if they were doing anything, it was typically out of their foundation, their corporate social responsibility portfolios, and they viewed it as a philanthropic part of their investment in the world. Today, it is so rapidly changing. And for those of you that are from the business community, I'm sure you can share your own stories. But we're seeing we have several hundred very large multinational corporations that are members of our coalition. And they are investing it from their business bottom line. So we are seeing businesses that are hiring people to do uh, focus on development. Uh, Walmart, for example, is one of our, our big corporate sponsor, supporters. And they just did a, a, a MOU you with USAID in Guatemala where they're an investment in small farmers and it's exactly the kind of partnership that both Nancy and Carolyn are talking about so that if you help a small farmer with expertise from a corporate world understanding the supply chain and USAID in this case can come in with some you know seed money not necessarily seeds but some investment money that you can create the kind of partnership so that it what you what the American government is investing on has a way to go be much bigger in terms of its long-term sustainability. Um, and so we're seeing this in, in, you talked about PepsiCo, there are companies after companies that are investing, and we also are all talking about all of us are seeing young people mm -hmm. that used to go say, oh, I want to go into global health or global development, and they were looking at it more from the, uh, the, the saving the world concept. And I'm meeting these young people who are coming to my office and saying, I want to go into the business side of international development. And I wouldn't have met anybody like that five years ago, six years ago, because they weren't sure they could get jobs. And now these corporations are interested. So I, I think, again, this is part of that sea change of how people are thinking about how do we, how does NGOs, government, and business work together effectively? What, what is the advantage that each of us bring to the table? Yeah, I mean, the conversations that I have now with Seems corporate partners is just a totally different yeah. conversation. It is not about go talk to the foundation and see if we can get them to write a check. It is about what are the issues that we're working on, what are the issues they're most interested in, how does it tie to their bottom line and to their business. And that's what corporations really want to talk about. And there's a huge, and it's also not just about the, the dollar piece. Um, it's about the human capital and the 
the skill sets that so many corporations can bring that save the children just we don't have them we don't we can't build supply chains like a PepsiCo can oh, build or a Coca-Cola yeah. can build I mean they have a supply chain that is just unbelievable there's not a place you can go on earth that you can't buy their product right they've figured that out so how do we leverage that supply chain for the kinds of things that we're trying to do around health and education. It is not lost on corporate America that 95% of the world consumers are outside the U.S. and the yeah. fastest growing uh, economies are in the developing world. Right. They, they see it, they know it, they want to be part of it. And that, that's, AID has reorganized right. to enable more effective uh, ab uh, ability to leverage those partnerships with a lot of the reforms that are really taking hold right now under uh, the leadership of, of Dr. Shaw. And there's been um, an increase of our use of investment approaches, uh, the development credit authorities, and r really seeking to enable those partnerships to be more effective for the longer term sustainability. So we're seeing, I think, that sea change taking hold really throughout the sector, through the business, through the NGO, and through um, AID as a key development partner. Great. Nancy, I know one of the other regions of the world that is very much on people's minds these days is the, is the Horn of Africa. And I, I, I know you have uh, deep experience there and, and your, um, your, your agency is very involved. How do we assess the situation there today? What can be done? How is this theme of partnerships and looking for results going to play out in, in the Horn of Africa? I, I think what we have uh, in the Horn right now is really a three-part emergency. We have the drought-affected communities in Ethiopia and Kenya. You have the refugees that are almost a million strong right now who have come across the border in horrible emaciated shape, mainly women and children, uh, in the camps in Ethiopia and Kenya, and an increased number actually in Yemen, uh, which I think is a telling uh, indicator that one would think Yemen is your safe haven. And, and then, of course, we have the 4 million out of a population of somewhere around 8 to 10, numbers are squishy, in Somalia, um, 750,000 of, of whom um, are in acute famine state. And we don't use the word famine lightly. It really applies to a state of serious excess mortality uh, malnutrition and lack of access to food. This is the most serious crisis on the globe right now with 13 million people, 13.2 million people who are affected, which is New York and Los Angeles combined. Um, it, it is an extraordinary uh, crisis. What is, as I mentioned earlier, Kenya and Ethiopia in the drought affected communities, we've seen progress. We have partnerships with uh, many of you in this room, and most importantly with the governments, local governments, national and regional structures. And we have a convergence right now among the donor community and in partnership with those governments to really take seriously the opportunity to break the cycle of devastating droughts. And as we look forward, you will see over the next six months uh, a, a series of events that are laying the tracks to really build on the humanitarian action uh, and the resiliency that has been built through humanitarian work and take it forward with the policy change and the investments that can help transform those countries and enable those communities to withstand the impacts of drought. This is an important moment and again, this is where we need the sustained attention. Every time there's a big drought, there's a big push of emergency response it's carrying it through to that longer term, linked to the policy changes, linked to the kinds of investments uh, that will make a difference. I mean, the, the road in Garissa, where in northeast Kenya, where I was about a month ago, the paved road literally ends in Garissa. And beyond, you've got northeastern Kenya, the arid lands area, where the malnutrition rates are off the chart. There's been little investment in any kind of infrastructure very low education, it's, it's moving that kind of investment forward that can be transformative. Um, that's, that's where uh, I think we, we have the opportunity. Somalia is a different story uh, given the complexities there. Um, 
What I would say is because of Somalia's history of complexity, I think that's uh, resulted in less attention by the American public. It's too complicated. They've heard about it before. And it's a startlingly low number of Americans who have contributed to this crisis in the Horn. Mm -hmm. And 13 million plus affected in the Horn versus 3 million affected by Haiti and 2 million in the tsunami. And yet, the fundraising is minuscule minuscule as a measure of public engagement. We've launched last week at USAID in partnership with the faith communities, the NGOs, the One Campaign, a campaign called Famine, War, Drought, or FWD, which is really about drawing people in, helping them to connect and engage on this crisis, and then also pivoting to what the opportunities are through building this greater resiliency through the Feed the Future activities. Um, and so I, com I, I urge you to go to the website, uh, usa.gov slash FWD. Uh, and you can also text a donation that benefits a coalition of organizations uh, like SAVE, World Vision, Mercy Corps, um, CRS, and others uh, as, a, as a means of helping people to get into what is a very complicated issue. Um, and for some reason has not uh, been able to really get into their sphere, but we need people to be engaged and understand this complexity. Liz, you earlier mentioned the, the 2010 election. Um, let's talk about the 2012, not the election, but, but the campaign. These issues that we're talking about that we've all gathered here because we're interested in today have not been certainly a dominant part of the conversation uh, so far so far in the campaign. How do you see this? Do you see these issues surfacing? Where do they surface? How can people in this room and beyond um, play a role in that? Uh, we uh, run a educational um, initiative that we did in 08 and we're doing it again. We call it Impact 2012, Building a Better, Safer World. And uh, with the, the help of the wonderful Gates Foundation, they're working to really engage the, both the presidential and the congressional about the issues of development and diplomacy and why they're so important. So when we started this campaign, I looked at the election and thought this is going to be obviously very, very different than 2008, <coughs> where we started with the principle of, in 2008, they were going to talk about foreign policy. I mean, we were, as personally, if you think back on 2007, the, the war was going to be a topic, the Iraq war was going to be a topic. Uh, we knew people would talk about it. 2010, I started going on the websites of candidates running for office. You could not find uh, a, a part of their website on foreign policy. You could find national security, and it almost solely dealt with bring the troops home or bring the wherever they felt on the troops. But nothing on foreign policy, which shows you that was 2010. 2012, I haven't done the research yet, but I assume it'll be the same. This conversation is about jobs, jobs, and jobs. And so if we want to enter the conversation, we have to enter it around jobs. And we have done some of that. I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. We'll do a clip. But this is a little brief that I did with the Chamber of Commerce and 20 business leaders to talk about why investing in development matters to America's economy. Um, and we want these candidates to get. So I've already met with uh, just about every foreign policy uh, aide to the presidential. And I've been watching these debates. And I hold my breath through the, you know, practically through two hours of debate saying, please don't ask a foreign policy question. And sure enough, our luck ran out in uh, Las Vegas last week, where if you of saw all it, of all places, <laughs> uh, our, luck <laughs> our luck runs out. And one of the end questions, how many of you saw that? Did you see the debate, any of you? You know, okay, so you know what I'm So one person knows our time. So sure, a woman stands up in Las Vegas and says to the Republican candidates, we're giving too much money for foreign aid. What's your position on foreign aid? Well, Ron Paul, we knew, would be horrible on this because he believes we have to zero out foreign assistance. But the rest of them, as my meetings have gone, have been fairly thoughtful about these issues. For example, Romney, the, the potential front runner, has a book 
that a chapter in his book called Soft Power, where he actually talks about the importance of using development and diplomacy. So I'm like, OK, let's hope in the 30-second soundbite they'll say something useful. So Perry gets the first ask. And he gives this horrendous answer about we have to you know, basically blow up the UN. I'm <laughs> paraphrasing. So if there's press here, get, I'll give you the real quote. And then um, Romney goes next. And we were joking that he gave not only a terrible answer, but an almost incomprehensible answer about how we should, we should really get the Chinese to get more involved in our humanitarian um, efforts. So we're going to advocate, you know, advocate our, our humanitarian efforts to the Chinese. Well, within 24 hours, the Romney campaign had written a clarification, and you all would have liked the clarification. But what that said to me, Tim, is that in the 30-second soundbite game, while the campaigns are thinking about these issues, I think in a thoughtful way, the candidates haven't gotten it into their briefing books to think about how do I, candidate, Perry, Huntsman, whomever, want to talk about and think about foreign assistance. Romney had given a speech, his first big foreign policy speech, in South Carolina about three weeks ago. And again, very thoughtful commentary about these issues, not in detail but thoughtful. So next Saturday night, the 12th, in uh, Spartansville, South Carolina, there is going to be the first debate that's focused just on foreign policy, and then there'll be another one on the 15th. So we're working very hard to try to give them a 30-second soundbite that both reflects how I think they see the world, but also that works for them politically. But what will come up, and I think this is what the work in front of all of us, is that there is this belief that Carolyn mentioned, that everybody thinks it's 25% of the budget. And so that if you can get rid of, you know, you can, you can solve our deficit reduction problem by getting rid of it. And they all will say, I met with the majority uh, leader of the House, Eric Cantor, last week with some of our coalition members, and, he's, and who's pretty supportive of these issues. And he said, well, if I pull my 750,000 constituents and, they, and say, what do you think is most important to cut, foreign assistance is going to top that chart. So politically, there's this knee-jerk instinct that, that politicians think their constituents constituents don't care. Mm. And so what we need to do, and that goes back to Global Washington, is do what all of you do as part of this, is to say we do care, that it matters to our moral beliefs, it matters to our national security, and it matters to our economics. And right now, there is not a large enough voice, particularly on the Republican side, of people who are engaged in Republican par primaries, which is different than the general election voting population. Um, that is interested in these issues, that is talking about these issues in a positive way. And, and that is an enormous challenge nationwide for us. You, you, you know, just building on that, next week is the APEC summit in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And one of the key themes of that summit is disaster resilience because um, people understand that there is a real economic loss when a country is not capable of withstanding the inevitable shocks. And in the Asia region, we have 60% of the world's disasters in terms of floods, mudslides, earthquakes. And it has huge business impact as well as humanitarian impact on people. We're seeing right now Thailand and Cambodia going underwater. Um, we've seen Indonesia struggle with all manner of, of different events, New Zealand and Japan as well. But so, so there's a ministerial level uh, conference on disaster resilience that Secretary Clinton will lead. And I, I will be participating in an event where AID is with um, our corporate partners making the case for why it's important not just to provide assistance and investment after a disaster hits, but actually look at where those vulnerable places are and invest in that preparedness and that resiliency. And it's the Turkey story mm -hmm. that a 7.2 mm -hmm. earthquake hit. And as tragic as it is for the many who lost their lives, it could have been much worse. It could have been Haiti. And so it's, it's that opportunity at a turbulent time that it's both a humanitarian question and it has impact on businesses. You, when your operations are shut down because of, of these global uh, shocks that we know will continue to happen. Liz, you mentioned the clip, and it might be, if we have it queued up, a, a good 
time if we can get it set up and maybe you can give it a, a quick lead in. Sure, so why uh, somebody back there is figuring out how to put it on. Um, as I said, we were focused politically. This is about a jobs conversation is the national conversation. And I really believe development is, is essential in this. So we, we did this brief and then we put together a 60 second video clip that's about 100,000 video uh, views on YouTube. And it really tries to tell in an interesting way um, how do you make the case that investing in development is important to us. So it was, uh, do we have it queued up? Can we queue it up? Sure. Okay. So the international affairs budget is the terminology in Washington that covers that, the, uh, the development. So that's what you'll hear talk about. With our economy the way it is today, some people are asking why we're spending so much money overseas and not on creating jobs right here at home. Well, actually, we're not spending much money. Just 1% of our national budget <laughs> goes to the international affairs budget. That's not a lot. And helping create American jobs is just what that money's doing. If you want to create jobs, you have to create more demand for products and services. You need more customers. And where are American companies finding more customers? Not here. But here. And here. And here. 95% of the world's customers live outside the U.S. 95%? When we sell goods to them, they're called exports. U.S. exports counted for a big part of our economic growth last year. Half went to developing countries. And their economies are growing three times faster than developed countries. And every 10% increase in exports equals a 7% increase in jobs here. So, how do we increase exports? Build new markets for American goods and services. Remember that 1%? America's international affairs budget helps fund programs that improve health and education, supports agriculture development, <laughs> builds a stable economy, and creates new markets. So if we don't go to the biggest, fastest growing group of consumers, other countries will. Other countries already are. Investing a small amount in global development and diplomacy is not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. To make our economy stronger. To create more jobs. For my mom. For my dad. For my neighbor. For me. Well done. I, I want to come back to something, Carolyn, you mentioned earlier, and actually I think all of you have, have mentioned women and girls or women or girls. Mm -hmm. And there certainly is increased recognition about not only the role of women and girls, but the interventions aimed specifically for women and girls. Talk a little bit about what SAVE is doing around this and why it's important. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for Save the Children and for our mission, um, working with women and girls is, is integral um, to, to doing the things that we do. So if you look at really any of the, the areas where we work, but, but start with maybe child mortality and you look at how are we going to save the lives of, of more children, you need to start with mothers. And so a lot of our work now is working with mothers on safe practices in birth and safe practices in terms of taking care of their children. A lot also of the work that we do with communities is working with women. So our whole frontline health worker um, effort, it's not all women. We do have some men who are frontline health workers as well. Um, but a lot of them are women. And they are women who typically have you know, a third or fourth grade education. These are not um, tremendously well-educated um, people. But they are very committed to working in their community. And so if we can give them a little bit of training uh, they will give back to their community and they will, they will do things that will save kids' lives. I think that's the other well-known, um, a lot of you probably in this room know, that if you increase the economic power of women, that those funds go directly back to their families. And there's lots of studies at looking how women use 90% of what they earn to put it back into the education of their children, into food for their children, into you know, basic household necessities for their kids. And um, you know, that's what's going to kind of change the, the, the whole cycle. 
And when it comes to girls, there's, a, again, a tremendous amount of data out there that says for every year you keep a girl in school, you improve the lives of her children because she will stay in school longer, which means she probably won't give birth at as early an age. So instead of having a child at 13 or 14, she's going to have that child at 17 or 18. When she's much better able to have that child, that child's probably not going to be low birth weight. She's going to take better care of her kids because she's more educated. She's going to put her efforts into making sure that her children are educated and healthy. So it's just this, this cycle and investing in women and girls is clearly one of the best investments we can make. So, so it's an integral part of what Save the Children does. Um, we often say, you know, to save a child, we have to save a mother. So we spend a lot of time on that issue. Thanks. And Nancy, could you talk about how USAID is thinking about investing in women and girls and, and maybe the changes you've seen first at, from outside the agency now that you're in the agency about how the U.S. government's thinking about investing in women and girls? Uh, it, it is a huge priority in, all, in ensuring that with our, both our health programs, our economic development, our agricultural programs, for all the reasons that Carolyn just said, that we ensure that women um, are a key part of those groups. Um, I would also add that there's a, a government-wide initiative that uh, relates to the UN uh, 13, it's called 1325, which is really looking at how we work with women in conflict because they are at, especially affected. And we're seeing that right now in Somalia where it's the women who are trekking um, for, for days, carrying their children uh, and showing up in the refugee camps in a very emaciated state. They're uh, with, with lots and lots of rapes. So how do we work with women in those environments as well as a priority? So it's really both sides of, of the equation. Uh, in, in the visit that I just did to Ethiopia last month, I met a woman who uh, relayed to me that last time there was a big famine, she was pregnant with her first child, and they all had to leave the village. Everybody had to go in search of food. And this drought, uh, their productivity is out, be, is up because of the investments um, that we've made uh, uh, with one of our NGO partners there. Um, and nobody's had to leave. Uh, and she has now uh, sent all of her five children to school. And the oldest is in university. So this, to me, is a very uh, important capsule of what can happen when you make those investments at the time of crisis and you enable that to, to roll forward into longer term development. Great. Well, we said, or I said, we'd give you an opportunity to ask questions and that time has come now. Um, we have some mics, I think, floating around the room. And I, I'd like to take maybe three questions and then go back, um, go back to the panel with them. So first one right here. We can get a mic there, and there's a second question there. Or shout. Or shout. And please, um, for those asking questions, identify yourself. Uh, Thank you, ladies. My name is Julie, and I'm a volunteer with Results. And you have brought up today the importance of foreign aid, and I want to bring to attention to everyone that on Wednesday, the foreign aid bill is coming to the Senate floor. And so this is really our opportunity right now to make a difference. There is a 20% difference already in the budget from last year. So if we don't take a stand now, it's going to be even more grim. So I'd like to give each one of you all the opportunity to, today to call Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell. Their telephone numbers are at the back of the room on a poster available. But I'd also like you to read, I'd like you to write down their number, write the second if you don't mind. So, Patty Murray, 202-224-2621. Senator Cantwell, 202-224-3441. And you would like to just tell your name, that you are a constituent, and you want them to oppose any cut to foreign aid. Thank you. Oh, was there a question in there? 
I just, I just want to say that, because um, I was up on the Hill last week, and hearing from constituents is absolutely the most important thing that we can do right now. And what I heard when I was on the Hill was we aren't hearing from people. We aren't hearing from our constituents that this is an important issue. So, so I would just urge everybody to make the phone calls, because it does make a huge difference. And they log them. They know how many they get. They keep records of what people are calling about. So it does really make a difference. Can I just underscore one thing? Um, Julie, thank you for bringing that up. Everything that Nancy's trying to do and Carolyn's trying to do and any other of the NGOs that are represented today are in dire situation because of the political environment on Capitol Hill. The bill that, may, that is most likely going to come up on Wednesday, though I can tell you we're working very hard to try to encourage Senator Reid not to bring it up, but they likely bring it up is going to have cutting amendments because this political environment I talked about on the presidential. You happen to have two fabulous senators, one of whom is playing an absolutely essential role on the broader issues on the super committee. Please call. We need to empower our champions. Because I can tell you right now, we are already, we are, we are in the prospect of looking at 20% cuts to non-war development and maybe higher over two-year period. And it's going to affect humanitarian crisis. It's going to affect our long-term development and women and girls that say the children is at the forefront of. It's going to check, it's going to impact the Feed the Future initiative on ag development. It is so concerning to those of us who are watching it that I urge you, and if you have relatives or friends, that live in other states that might have particularly some Republican senators, I urge you to call them and ask them to make the same phone calls to their senators as well. Great. Thank you. Another Hi. question. There we go. Hello. Um, thank you so much. It's really inspiring to see such amazing um, women leaders in this field. It's really inspiring. Um, my name is Lacey Price, and my question is kind of based on the assumption that this rigor for results is um, for the purpose of keeping dollars coming in the door so that we can keep these programs going. So feel free to um, let me know if that's incorrect. Um, but my question is this, um, is there another side to this rigor for results where we also need donors to understand and be okay with the fact that we can only tie their dollars to impact so specifically and that there are actually a variety of factors that contribute to the success or the failure of a project? Um, if we keep raising and measuring funds, are we at risk of people missing the bigger picture and then people get fatigued and therefore don't want to continue funding things? Well, uh, let, me, let me just clarify a little bit. The, the rigor for results to me is the outcomes that, that we're trying to drive for children and families. It's not about, it, it happens to be a really good argument for the dollars, but that's not why we, we want to focus on results. And in fact, when you look at collecting that information inside of the, the kinds of program work that we do that's funded by USAID and others, it's about making those programs work better. That's the biggest reason for collecting that information is because you can go back and say, well, you know, what worked and what didn't and how do I make it better? And that's really, really important. So I think that focus has to, needs to stay there. It is very hard to balance those things. Uh, there's only so many people in the organization. There's so, only so many uh, you know, people you can put on a project to do one versus the other, run the programs versus measure the results. I think the real trick is building that into the way that you work. And the way that you work is very much about looking at those results from the very beginning of how you design a program and, and then in how you implement it. But, but I think if I, if I indicated that the reason we have results is so that we can justify why we get the money, that's not why. It's to make the programs better and to deliver on what we're trying to deliver for the people that we're serving. So. Yeah, I, I would underscore that, that uh, and, and USAID, as part of its reform uh, agenda, has put forward a new evaluation policy because we need to understand what's working, not just for the dollars, but for the sake of understanding where do we focus, what do we do more of, what do we do less of. And uh, part of the new Center for Excellence for Democracy, Rights, and Governance is very much tackling the issue of how do we understand um, the, the relationship of accountable democratic governance to development results. We're also moving forward with an effort to understand our, our impact in complex environments. And again, it's, 
you know, everybody who gets up every morning working on these tough issues, you want to know you're making a difference. And we have, I think, as a community, moved beyond no measurement to measurement of outputs to moving toward a better understanding of well, what does it add up to. A piece of that is the ability to work in partnerships and to aggregate in a way across different programs so that it adds up to the bigger picture, which we're all driving towards, which is you know, the development of that community, that country. Um, so th I think it's one of the most important challenges that we have for, for that purpose. It's actually one of the things that I'm most concerned about in terms of the budget. Because over the last few years, even before Tea Party mania happened and all this uber focus on spending cuts, which is I think your political point happened, there's really been a bipartisan effort to get development right, both by the NGOs and the, and the out of government and, and the government. And this administration has taken it to a whole new level, building on what the last administration did, but the whole new level. And under Nancy and some of her colleagues' leadership, they put together this USAID forward, which is the name for their effective monitoring, evaluation, transparency operation. To, to put, you can go right now for, and go on to you know, the, the foreign aid, the, the, the USAID dashboard, and you can see projects that taxpayer money is going for in development, and is it working, and is it not. And frankly, it's the kind of thing that every agency in our government should have. I know I personally, and I don't think anybody in this room, is going to go out there and advocate for something that we don't think is results driven, having nothing to do with the political po uh, point that it makes. We have to go up to Capitol Hill and say we are for development because we think it's good for lots and lots of reasons, but every one of these dollars has to be driven by results. And I'm really proud of the fact that our government has taken that seriously, because I know the NGOs have always done that, but that the government is really trying to find a way to do it. So I think you, when you make your phone call to Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell, I think you can all feel very proud that the kinds of reforms, it's not done. I think Nancy would say there's work to be done. I won't put you on the spot on that, but I think that I can say from the outside, the kinds of reforms and, and structure that needs to take place to make sure that the dollars are being used well is on the right path, and the kind of budget cuts we're looking at would absolutely take us backwards. I, just, on your point about risk, because I think that's an important part, we're, we're operating in a lot of environments with a lot of factors. And um, we have made it very clear that there needs to be tolerance for risk. Uh, and we need to do that, though, with the small bets that help us understand, is this working, is it not working? And then on that basis, scale it up and ensure that we're moving on a pathway towards results. Thank you. Great. Other questions from the audience? We have one, two here. And I see a couple up, up there. So we'll start with these two and then move to that area. Hello, I'm Suzanne Griffin from Washington State University, and I'm wondering if all of you could briefly define what you, we talked about aid that works, and one of the things, I'm, I've just come back from Afghanistan for my, I don't know how many trips, um, sustainability. What does that mean to you, not at the macro level, but at the on the ground level? Okay, we're gonna field some questions and then go back to the panel. Hi, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm Lisa Cohen with the Washington Global Health Alliance. And um, my question, uh, first of all, I just wanted to um, say that for people who are going to call into the senator's um, offices, to call, not email. My daughter's working in Patty Murray's office, and they have a five to six a week backlog on the emails right now because of the super committee. So you may want to call. Um, but the second, my actually, my, my uh, serious question is, with all of the news this week about the, well, today, the seven billionth child born, and this is particularly um, for Carolyn, how do you message that? Because you've got all of us in this room, we get it, right? And we also, we all know that actually um, uh, women have fewer children when they're healthier. Mm -hmm. But we're facing a huge overpopulation problem, and what isn't said in polite circles is the concern about overpopulation and why are we working so hard to improve the health of these people? What do you say to the people who aren't in this room? Yep. Okay, two more up here. Uh, yeah, my name is Dan Kranzler, 
with the Kirlin Foundation and Seeds of Compassion. I'd like to uh, ask a slightly different question and, and bring this more into uh, focus uh, in terms of uh, practical issues. And we talk about funding uh, areas of interest and we talk about partnerships a great deal. We have this reality which is funding for all uh, organizations are being reduced right now in these times and, and as a foundation it's a challenge to try to fund all the great things going on. Talk to me a little bit more, uh, more about what we can do to create partnerships within organizations with which we work and Nancy I'll put you a little bit on the spot. Uh, you know, aid is uh, one I was told of 23 different agencies in the government that work on the foreign development uh, foreign aid, global development uh, issues, and many very independently. What do you do within your agencies to partner with each other to try to become more efficient in the dollars that you have available to get them out into the children that matter? And, and what, do the, uh, what do the other agencies do? What do we do to help you and help our organizations that we fund do a better job of partnering so that we reach larger uh, segments of the population more effectively? Okay, just and one more, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, hello, my name is Barton Pitchford. I'm with World Arts Access. Um, I'm also serving uh, or finishing out a six-year service contract with the military, and have deployed uh, both to Yemen and Pakistan, and have seen the, um, I guess the the successes of what interagency cooperation and using development both for economic uh, stability as well as for strategic uh, defense stability. Um, what those successes can be. Uh, my question is, and it goes back to, um, to what we can do as organizations, uh, not just to speak to our government, but to get the word out by and large to the constituency uh, throughout America, because we here recognize what development does. Um, you're preaching to the choir when you talk to this group of people. But the farmer in Iowa or the teacher in rural Louisiana, they do not. Um, so how do we as a, as a sector reach out to those people and, and, and get them to better understand what foreign development does both for the economic sector and also for the strategic uh, national defense? Okay, just a, a quick recap on the questions. We had one about what does sustainability mean? One about how to message the seventh billion child um, a funding question about what can be done to create partnerships, and this one targeted specifically at Nancy. Um, what is USAID doing in terms of partnership within the U.S. government? And then what can we do to reach out to the American population? Why don't we start with you, Nancy, on the, the one that was directed specifically to you. Okay. Um, that's a really important question, and it's a, a question that this administration has taken seriously. And there are two specific initiatives that I think are modeling how we might want to go forward, how we are going forward. One is Feed the Future, which is uh, led by USAID, but it harnesses the energy and the programming of uh, the State Department, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, Department of Commerce, and it really says that to make the kind of progress that we need, we need to increase uh, in sustainable development there's been an underinvestment in agriculture for decades. So we need to increase that. We need to couple it with new technologies. And we need to couple it with the kind of policies at the regional and national level that will enable this kind of progress to go forward. Um, another one is called Partnerships for Growth, which is a similar harnessing of the capabilities throughout the US government and looking at four specific countries. It's a, it's a strategy of focus um, where Philippines, Ghana, uh, El Salvador, and Tanzania have been singled out to, to get that kind of supercharged focus of the resources and capabilities across the government to push them forward into the next level of development. Um, and Millennium Challenge Corporation is an important part of those partnerships as well. There's a recognition that only by bringing together our collective efforts, can we really move forward on this critical agenda? Um, I would also add that at times of disaster, uh, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance um, and the Office of Military Affairs, both of which are in my bureau, specifically um, 
are, uh, reach out and harness the capabilities across the U.S. government and uh, the military has been a critical partner because of their uh, specific and unique capacities to uh, respond at, at a time of a sudden onset disaster with lift capability and uh, those sorts of things. So your question is the right one and we're tackling it with a lot of energy um, and I think we're showing some progress and some results and we hope to be able to have the opportunity to really continue that drive forward. Thanks. And because we're running out of time, we'll have, but we want to try to get at least quickly uh, short answers to these, these questions. Uh, Carolyn, how do we message the seventh billion? Yeah, so um, you mentioned that we, we know the, the, the specifics here, that as you drive down um, child mortality, that the fertility rates do go down. There is a great example out there, which is um, Thailand. A perfect example where I think if you looked at the statistics, something like, you know, on average six children uh, per family, it's now down to, I think it's under two at this point. And certainly the child mortality rates have significantly dropped in that country, along with all sorts of other things like ec economic development. But I think giving specific examples. The other thing is that family planning does have to be part of what we're all doing. And it is certainly part of what Save the Children does. Um, it goes back to that question about women and girls and the empowerment of women and their ability to seek family planning services is a really important part of all of this. Um, but I think there's a very good argument, well documented, that this is not about as we as we do international development, the population you know explosion is worsened. It really there is lots of evidence that that's not the case. And then we need to make the argument on empowering women on the family planning side as well. Can so. I just add one, one other thing on that? On both the Horn of Africa, the seven billion that we hit, there are sadly so, some sad and some great opportunities. There are, na there are international news going on that gives us an opportunity to message that it matters to us. I hope everybody wakes up in the morning and says, my goodness, this 13.2 million people need my help and I'm going to write out a check. And, and that we, we morally have a commitment to give. I think a lot of us as Americans are driven by that. But in addition, in this environment, we have to make the case it matters. It matters to our security. It matters to our economics. We can make the case when the seven billion number happened, it was about to happen. I said to my communications people, you know, who's writing the op-ed and making sure you make the case. And that's what we need to do is make the connection. It matters here. That's why your calls make a difference. I, I, I would add Ethiopia has a very good news story yes, in the absolutely. midst of this horn that their birth rate has actually dropped from a, about 5.6 to 4.9. To 4 and I, again, that's part of the pathway, I think, to, to improvement. Um, I, 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 I want to underscore Liz's point about the horn being that moment where this is a huge crisis and embedded in it there are opportunities and there are uh, vi ways of moving forward that we're seeing bear fruit in Ethiopia and Kenya. We need the engagement, we need people to connect and to be informed and to quote President Obama, this is where our interests and our values really align. Where that humanitarian spirit that is so present in the American public really does align with security. We're seeing what happens with the continued insecurity of a place like Somalia and the impact that it's having regionally and globally. Um, and we're also seeing the economic impact, again, of the piracy of Somalia. So we, we need to, to grab this moment to re renew our commitment. And again, there's, there's great infographics on the website that will enable you to forward uh, the facts to all of your friends and neighbors and really inform, connect, and engage. Yeah, I think this just um, ties into what the gentleman um, who served in Yemen and, um, and Pakistan, and thank you for that. Those are probably two of the hardest places to work as a soldier, so thank you for that. I, I think it ties back into your question of how do we get the general public to really care about this? And social media is a huge opportunity for us to be able to do this. So you're all here. You all have networks that you have on Facebook, that you have on Twitter. You should be out there talking about these issues to your own audience and getting the word out. And your organizations should certainly be doing that on an organization-wide basis as well. And whether it's the horn, which is a great, you know, there are some people that the, the, um, it takes an emergency, it takes a humanitarian disaster for them to kind of get this message fine. We have 
we have we happen to have one of those and you should absolutely be out there talking about it but also just the work that you're all doing and using those social networks to get the word out to the average American who does not have the same kind of knowledge as is in this room. So using those networks to do that is really important. On, on the military front, I can tell you that um, we put a group up on Facebook that we call Veterans for Smart Power. Within about two and a half weeks, 16,000 veterans d liked it. So there is some, the, the veterans, and again, I, re, I, I, I thank you for your service. I can't see who you are, but yeah. whatever you are, is what, what you can do. Washington State is unique. I, I wish every state was like this in terms of getting their for, your forward thinking. You understand how the world is connected to us. Your citizens understand. You react to it in multiple ways over and over again. Not every state is the same in terms of that collective energy, but every state, every state has people who understand that we're connected in the world, whether it's through the moral, the security, or the economics. I travel around the country a lot. I know Carolyn does as well as Nancy used to much more in-state, now internationally. If you have family and friends from other states, we are going to be in key primary states. I have an event, in, two events in South Carolina coming up, one in New Hampshire, one in Florida. We'll be in Ohio, we'll be in Pennsylvania, we'll be in Virginia. That we are organizing just like this to engage people to add their voice and educate of why development and engaging the world matters. And so we would invite you to get those people to join us or other organizations that are out there doing this. Um, I am absolutely convinced that the American public cares and believes that we want an America that's going to be engaged in the world. We do not want an America that's going to close the doors of the borders. And that means getting up in the morning and helping people millions of miles away that we'll never meet and never know get out of poverty deal with the famine, become and have an opportunity to enjoy what all of us do, even in our economic crisis. And to do that, that's going to require all of us to be out there using social networking forward. This is an amazing site, what, what USAID has done, this new campaign. It's fun. It's easy. It, you know, I'm sorry to say fun and something so horrific. But it's got all the social elements into it. It's easy to forward it. Forward it. Not enough money is being raised for this right now. We've got to change the way people are reacting to the Horn of Africa. And this is our moment to do it. And if there's anything you all go out there to do today, call your congressmen, senators, and forward this to as many friends and families as you have. Well, thank you. I told you at the beginning you were in for a treat. I hope you agree with me that you have been. And please join me in, in thanking this, the, the fabulous panel we have. And Bukta is going to... Yes, thank you all for coming because you've come a long ways and, and you're very, very busy. But this was absolutely fabulous.